verse 1, 6th chapter of the book of Mark, New International Version, 1984. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Quote, where did this man get these things, end quote, they asked. And what's this wisdom that has been given to him? That he even does miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to him, Jesus said to them, only in his hometown among his relatives and in his own house as a prophet without honor. He could, did not, he could not do many miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've done all this weekend. Our hearts are moved as we see people crying out to you, being baptized, repenting of sin. Our hearts are moved, God, by all that's taken place, even here this morning, and what you're going to do tonight. We're grateful for all those online and all those gathered here on this beautiful day in Alaska. We're asking that you would move with power. We're asking you to come and to show up, but show off healing the sick, setting the captives free, and release unto us keys on how to release the anointing. Release to us, God, keys and principles tonight so that as to release revival, expose any blockage, expose any hindrance, expose anything that would shut down the power of God, not just now, but this week and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, brace yourself. And you may be seated tonight. What a passage of Scripture. What an amazing passage of Scripture. And in that passage, you see Jesus goes to the synagogue, goes to the church of his day, if you will. And he begins to do miracles. He begins to speak, and they're amazed at his speech with what wisdom is given him. And there's perceptions that are communicated in these few verses, six verses. You see the perception of the church people. If I can, can I call them church people? They're people that were in the synagogue. Their perception of people that are there in the service that Jesus is. I mean, can you imagine being in a service that Jesus is preaching? Oh. And a double-edged sword will come out of his mouth. What a day. What a day that'll be. And the perception on the Sabbath day is that they're blown away by the wisdom. Their view is, this is amazing. And they're, they're, you, can, you can tell from the verses that they're, people are genuinely moved, saying, where did this go? Where did he get this? And then their mind begins to engage. Their mind begins to engage about, now, wait a second. Wait a minute. Who is, is it, that's the carpenter. They begin to get offended. They begin to have an intellectual offense, as I've taught on and preached on this passage before. And their intellectual offense, because in their mind, they could not understand, how is it? Didn't we change his shorts when he was a little boy? How is 
is it that Jesus, how is it that Jesus, how is it that Yeshua is doing all this stuff with all the wisdom that he has? How is that? Because isn't, he's a carpenter. And aren't these his brothers and sisters? They begin to argue. You see, they, they build this, this case against why there is miracles. They build a case against why God's using this guy, Yeshua. Now to us, we read it and we're like, oh, it's Jesus doing miracles, miracles. But this shows how there's a shutting down of God's power. And in showing the shutting down of God's power, it gives us keys on how to release his power. Their view of the service You'll see right there with me. All who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? And what wisdom does he have? Isn't this the carpenter? And you'll see in verse, a little further down, they took offense at him. They took offense at him. Because in their mind, it made no sense that a carpenter, that especially this Jesus, and we know, his, and this is Mary's son, and how, how could this happen? And, and look, what, look what happens. They took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his own relatives, is in his own house, is a prop without honor. He could not do any miracles there. Now, wait a second. I thought earlier on he did miracles. Do you see that? What wisdom is given him, verse 2, and that he even does miracles. This is verse 2. So their view is he's doing miracles. His view is I didn't even get started yet. So their estimation of things is they look, they're like, man, he's got the wisdom, there's miracles, and he's like, you know, I can't can't do anything in here. You know, sometimes our view of what God can do is far less than actually what he wants to do and what hinders and shuts down the power of God is offense, is unbelief. There's many things that shut down the anointing, the power of God. I remember, and some of you will enjoy this, you know, when I came into the church, it was, I didn't have a cute shirt on when I came in. And I have no polished shoes when I came in either. I practically crawled into this church Many years ago, 1992 is the first time I came into Kings. God got a hold of me after a series of backslidings. I backslid, I think, on and off for three years. So let that, I had a spirit of a yo-yo, a Duncan, a Duncan yo-yo spirit. How many of you know what a yo-yo is? It's loving God, backslid. Loving God, backslid. Don't worry, God can come on the good work that he began. He'll complete into the day of Christ Jesus. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you have a yo-yo spirit. I'm just so grateful that that God set me free from that. And shortly thereafter, rather rather rapidly, in God's infinite wisdom, to me, to my amazement, and to those that knew me, to their amazement, especially those that knew me from my previous life. Those that were my new friends in my new life, they, they were rejoicing, but I was made a pastor rather rapidly. I was elevated rather rapidly. And in the elevation of leadership with God's power and unction flowing on me and so many others, there was a group of people that saw me crawl into the church. They, they saw me. They, they, they're the, you know, there were the aunties and uncles, not all of them, but some. Some that were in the way for a long time. 
And I don't look down my nose at them because I've found that that same thing wants to come on me at times. And in their mind, they're thinking, we know where this kid came from. So how is it? I remember one specific service, Dr. Morocco called us up, not unlike we do here, and a fire of the Holy Ghost was resting on me. I was trembling. I was either going to run around. In fact, I was known for the guy that would run around the building. I don't run around here because it's too small. I might kill someone. I'm going to run in that. Fr- I'm t- I'm almost, I can almost promise you in that new sanctuary, I'm going to take off in that first service. Either that or I'll be a hot mess and a pile, of, a, a puddle of tears in the front. I don't know which one it will be. At some point, I'm sure I'll run. So he called us up, and he had us begin to pray. And I was moving from the left side, your right, my left, the left side of the sanctuary, praying with other pastors. The power of God was touching people. Miracles were happening. And, and I was overtaken by the power of the Holy Ghost. So that's my experience. I felt like I became another man. And that can happen under the anointing. Under the unction of the Holy Spirit, he can come on you And you can become like someone else, full of boldness, full of fire, full of zeal, flowing in the wind of the Spirit, just blowing through you. Those are the services you want to be at when it's like that. May it ever be like that. Is it like that now? Not currently, but there is a marvelous presence of the Lord. So I began to lay hands on people, and I got to one particular sister who had her arms folded, And boom, boom, miracle, miracle, touch, prophesy, miracle, miracle. I went to lay hands on this person and like, it was like somebody flipped a switch and turned everything off. It's like, come on, you go to the bathroom, maybe you turn all, or the kitchen, you turn all the faucets on and just (laughs) hot water. Or you ever seen, you ever seen a dam being released? They open a valve and it just shoots out. It was like that. And then the next person I'm on, (laughs) off. And honestly, I, I used to. I don't do this anymore unless the Lord leads me to. I'll pray for someone. God's touching them. Boom. God's touching them. Boom. God's touching them. Get, God's touching them. Boom. Get to this person. Don't take this personally. Get to this person and like, boof, water's turned off. And I found that that happens sometimes when like your mama made you come and you don't really want to be up here and you could give a flip about whether I laid hands on you or not, but you're going to obey your mom because you want to eat dinner. Right? So, so it's just kind of like, yeah, whatever. And then I've seen God touch people like that, and, and even though they're just up here because mama said so and you want to eat dinner, I've seen them also get touched like, surprise, wham. <laughs> but other times I've seen people come up and be like, you don't have anything. I don't want anything of what you got. And in this case, when I opened my eyes, I laid hands, it was boom, turned off. I, I opened my eyes, and she's like, yeah. I'm going to wait for Dr. Moran. I was like, okay, and just move down the line. And honestly, what happened, I'm going to be honest with you. I wish to tell you that the dam opened wide up and I started flowing again, but what happened is I got hurt feelings. And so I prayed. So I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, laid hands on sister, and and I feel the dam closes, the valve closes. I open my eyes, and she's like, I'm going to wait for Dr. Morocco. And I thought, oh, okay, praise God. Amen. And I leave and go to the next person. Drip, drip. Drip, drip. Amen. Like, let's let some other pastors pray. And I, in my immaturity, I walked off and like, oh, hallelujah. Well, that was a pretty radical shutting down of the power of God. I mean, it was like somebody just, it's like turning the lights on, turn the light off. So Jesus wants to manifest his power in Mark 6, but they flip the switch off. And some of you will not experience God's power in your life to the degree that he wants you to because you're offended. Because of intellectual offense. And I can tell you on and on and on, there's reasons for answered prayer and there's reasons for prayer when it's not answered. Psalm said, if I regard sin in my heart, 
You would not have answered my prayer, Psalm 66. Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord's far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. How about New Testament, 1 Peter 3, 7, I just mentioned this recently. Husbands likewise dwell with them in understanding so that your prayers may not be hindered. So there's a hindering to the anointing and a releasing of the anointing. There's a hindering to answered prayer and there's a releasing for answered prayer. We need to find, to understand clearly how is it that God's going to move in this generation. It's not going to happen by lackadaisical, offended people that are just got an opinion of how it's going to happen. Northern California, many years ago, a group of aunties, praying grandmas, Prayed for God to put, not our praying grandmas, some other praying grandmas, prayed for God to pour out his spirit. Power of God hit Northern California. It's a true story. I believe it's in the 80s. Revival band began to break out and people began to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And these precious women, well-meaning, stopped coming to church. The pastor, I mean, they'd been in the church forever. They cried out. I mean, they led the charge on revival. So revival shows up, but they stop coming to church, so the pastor followed up on them, Wally. Hey, are you guys okay? We, we are praying for revival. We're having it. People are getting saved. They're getting filled with the Spirit. We don't want that kind of a revival. <laughs> well, what kind of revival, what do you think revival is? I don't know if you've ever drowned. I did. Two or three times. I'm not really sure about the third. I'm definitely sure about one of them. The other one, I think I was close. Surfing. And uh, I was in surf far, far beyond my ability. It was much larger than I should have been out. But I went anyway. I was in my 20s, and I was superhuman <laughs> in my mind. It's in great shape, ready to rock. Grew up been in the ocean since I was like 10. I'm ready. I remember putting my surfboard on top of the, of the car, and my mother yells out to me, Son? I'm like, Yeah, Mom. Did you ask the Lord if you could go surfing? I'm like, Did you ask the Lord if you could go surfing? <laughs> like, Yeah, Mom. I asked him. He said it's fine. I'm like, Sorry. You know, I totally mouthed off. Got in the car. And all the while as I'm driving, I'm like, I didn't really ask you to go surfing, but I know you're cool with that. <laughs> you know, I didn't really talk to him, but I was convicted that I lied. So I was like, you know, God, you know, it's good. Let's, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I went out. I paddled out. I got out there. It took me quite a while to get out. When I got out, how many of you know what that means? There's waves. You got to get beyond the breakers. You got to you got to get to a place where you can paddle to get in to ride them. As I get out there, I'm thinking it's huge, it's huge, God. He's like, "Yep, it's big." I'm like, "Yeah, like, hallelujah." And so I'm I'm praying. My arms recover. Some of you know what that's like. Your arms turn to noodles. About forty minute paddle, and here comes my wave. So I scratch, paddle hard. That's what that means. And then I I drop in. And I shoot down this way. It's so big that all I can think of is get off. Get off. Don't do that paddle again. I don't want to get caught on the inside. And so I shoot for the, the shoulder, it's called, and I blast off the back, and I'm totally terrified. And I'm the only guy there. It's not like a lot of people. It's one person, me, and Jesus, although I think he might have left me at that point. I paddle back out, and I'm terrified because I realize, what have you done? I'm out here. There's nobody out here. Uh, it's too big. And then in Hawaii, not like the sissified California waves, unless you're in Northern California. There's some big ones there. But anyway, <laughs> Mavericks. In Hawaii, there's no continental shelf. So in a minute, and I mean a minute, boom, the waves can double in size. And you could be there, it could be a certain size, and all of a sudden you can look, and there's these mountains coming in. And that's what happens. I'm out there floating around, going, oh, God, I should, probably should have asked you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. And I'm like, Lord. And the Lord speaks to me and says, son, 
You need to obey my word. You need to obey my voice. Don't disobey me. And I realize, okay, I'm sorry. He's like, all right. And I look and I see these mountains, these black mountains coming. And I thought, oh, God, what's that? <laughs> so I, 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 I'm thinking, do I paddle in or paddle out? But I'm way too far out, so I go to paddle out. And I paddle for as hard as I can. And I can't get, I can't get to the place where I'm past them. So they break on me one after another after another. And I drowned. I basically drown. My leash breaks. I lose my board. That's a big problem. And I'm out there. I'm rattling around on the, on the bottom, hitting coral, coral heads and getting hurt. And, and I, I'm drowning. And, and even when you get to the top and the waves are that big, you still can't breathe unless you have special gifts and techniques. So when you get to the top, it's all foam. So you just go like this. I'm just kidding. It doesn't work. <laughs> so you get to the top. You're still, you can't swim in the foam. And the foam is like, you know, 10 feet thick. So even though you got to the top, it doesn't matter. And so I got to the place where I was done. I couldn't hold my breath anymore. I, and they tell you, I've read all kinds of magazine articles about drowning and surfing and all of that. They say, don't panic. The number one thing they say is when you're getting hammered and you're in the soup don't panic don't worry I'm about to tie this into Mark 6 in just a second so here's what happens to me and it's happened three times I've, I've had drowning experience three times this one I think the enemy meant to kill me so I'm thinking don't panic I'm, whole, I, I'm, I'm out of breath don't panic 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 I'm like screaming don't panic in my head and I'm, I'm clearly panicking and I, I get peace comes all over me, and all I could think is, I've, I did it. I've, I've, I'm done. And so I just said, Jesus. And in that moment, I hit something. And I, I felt air, and I, I, I began to hit. I, I hit something. I had washed all the way in. And I, I stood up, took a big gasp of air, got hammered by some, some white water, was able to scramble in, my feet cut from from coral and lava rocks. I got in and I lied down on the beach and there was a couple that had been watching me in a car and they came up to me to see if I was okay. Can I tell you that first breath that I took, I think I was unconscious. I think the Holy Spirit stood me up and said, breathe. I stood up, I was like, Ugh. you know what revival is? Revival is when you haven't had a drop. Revival is when you come up and the, and the community just goes, Ugh. They breathe deep. That's what started to happen last night. And there's only about 1,500. I'll be about 1,500 people. I don't think there was more than that. Maybe, okay, 2,000. The point is that what happened last night needs to happen every single day with God using people, even though you might feel dishonored, even though you might feel like, well, they're, who are they going to? They're going to listen to me. Who am I? I'm just a carpenter's son. They were offended. The power of God will be released in this house to the degree that you honor his word, to the degree that you honor those who come to minister here. And if you have a lack of honor, you will shut down the anointing in the room. The way that you respond to God will be how he responds to you. I've found, and for the children that are here, all of you children, listen to me. You grow up in a church like this, it's very dangerous. And I'll tell you why it's dangerous. It's dangerous because there can be, if your parents don't help you and you don't understand, you don't hear what I'm telling you right now, you can think that this is just normal church. I've been around. This ain't normal. It should be. It should be, but it's not. There's something different, something unique. There's a freedom, there's a joy, there's a power, there's miracles. The worship's amazing. Thank you, Brother Toby and the whole team. Amazing. And if as a child or a, uh, a high school student or a junior hire or a senior hire, the truth is, no matter who you are, if you don't allow for the power of God to change you and you become over familiar with the things of God, you will position yourself for great difficulty. Overexposure to the things of God without change 
will destroy you. The same sun that melts the snow, the same sun that sun that hardens clay. God wants to come on you with power, but if you get like ho hum about it, you can set yourself up for literally missing out on what God wants to do. And I see it in churches. I see it in pastors' kids. Thank God, not mine. I see it. This ain't some stupid religious game we're playing. There's miracles, there's signs, there's wonders. The sin of familiarity, you can get real familiar with the things of God and lose your, lose your awe, lose the fear of the Lord. Isn't this Jesus? The same fire that warms people, people can set a forest on fire. Revival doesn't come by patterns and a set program. I believe in programs. A revival comes when people get hungry, when people get thirsty, when people get desperate. I can't watch videos like this that we just saw and not be wrecked by it. And you can tell the genuine and you can tell when it's not genuine because there is hype. There's a lot of hype out there. I mean, with all the media, there's a lot of hype. And I'm, I'm nervous about some of that. But I've had my own encounter. And that guy's shirt in front of me. Just over and over prophesying God speaking to me through a t-shirt. If your gospel doesn't affect others, it hasn't affected you. If, then if, you, if, if your relationship with Jesus isn't impacting other people, then you have to question whether actually you've had an encounter with God or not. I was uh, applying, or looking rather, at an application for a school of ministry. And one of the questions is, when did you have your encounter with God? What happened in your encounter with God? And you literally had to say when you had your encounter with God. Now, I'm not talking about salvation because, because they asked that question earlier on. When did you get saved? I got saved. Okay, and then you can tell the date. No, it wasn't, that wasn't the question. And it wasn't even have you been baptized on the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. They asked that question too. They asked, when was your encounter with God? That is a very different question. And if you don't know what I'm saying... Right now, it might be that you haven't had that kind of encounter with God. And I would also say, not to shame or blame you, but to say, he wants to bring you into an encounter with God. I met him. He rescued me. Almost 30 years ago. Almost 30 years ago. The very fact that 30 years ago, this young man, I'm still young, come on somebody. The very fact that 30 years ago I was impacted and I'm, st I'm still serving him, still weeping, still getting touched by God, still, still seeing miracles, 30 years. You, you try some dead religion, you won't be doing it for 30 years. You'll throw in the towel on that bull. They saw Jesus' wisdom. They were blown away, but they were offended. The gathering of information to affirm why there's no miracle power in your life. The gathering of information to affirm why you have no power in your life, and then people actually make a theology out of it. Don't allow the a battery of thoughts to insulate you from the reality that you haven't had an encounter. Oh, I know many of you have. When you see him and, you, and you're impacted by his truth, by his word, by his spirit. For me, uh, Toby, would you come? For me, What happened is, uh, for me, uh, I was in a teen challenge. 
was a student. I had to go, which is really humiliating because I wasn't a teenager anymore. Man, going to the stinking teen challenge, and I'm not even a teenager. That place rescued my life. I got kicked out, but it still rescued me. I love when teen challenge guys come because I'm like, man, I used to go. They're like, you're a graduate teacher. I said, no, I didn't graduate. I got kicked out. See, it's awesome because you're like, really? I mean, not that you should get kicked out, but God can take anybody. He can take any other flunky loser and use them. Amen. And all the way back on that back row, I could bring you to the almost the exact location, King's Cathedral Maui. The power of God came down that January in 1995 I heard I heard inexpressible sounds I heard inexpressible sounds of worship it did it did something to me the reality of heaven became more real than the reality of of the earth. And it was at that moment that God, God touched my hearing. He, he did something in my spirit. I heard angels singing and I, I heard music. I saw colors and lights. I experienced the glory of the Lord. Truth be told, the truth is this. Oh, I long for that to happen again. When I've had only moments. Because in most services, not unlike this one. Again, people texting. People thinking about what they're going to eat. People, and I, I'm not down on you. There's a lot of distractions, as our, our friend Debbie Rich Rester said. But when you get a hold of what David said, one thing I seek, David, King David. He had, all the, he had all the wealth, all the fame. He's at the highest place of, of the government in the strongest nation. There he is, King David, the blessing of God. And he says this, one thing I long for, that will I seek after, to behold the beauty, the beauty, that's what he says, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. I think King David knew something that I've tasted a little bit of. Maybe you have too. And some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's why I'm preaching to you right now to wet your whistle a little bit to tell you that whatever level of Christianity you got right now, there's a whole nother level. This state is going to break into revival when, when, when the people of this state stand up, realizing they were drowning, <gasps> they take a big breath of heaven because it changes you. Suicide rate will drop. Alcoholism will drop. Listen, if you've tasted and seen, you, you, you will stop smoking weed when you experience the glory of God. Because why would you do that? I've had people tell me about Adam smoked weed. Why would Adam smoke weed? How stupid. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, man, because in Genesis, he's given you every green herb, bro. Every green herb. So you can have the herb. You've killed way too many brain cells. <laughs> Isaiah. Chapter one, whoa. Chapter two, whoa. Chapter three, whoa. Chapter four, whoa. Chapter five, whoa. Israel, whoa, you sinners. Chapter 6. 
Oh, oh. The train of the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I'm trying to preach you hungry tonight. I'm not even going to go long. I want you to be so frustrated with whatever level of Christianity you have that when you go home, it produces in you a prayer. It produces in you a prayer time. produces in you a hunger. It produces in you a gasp. <gasps> I want that breath. I want that. Oh, I'm all stressed out. I need another plug. Let me have a little chew. Anybody got any Copenhagen? No? I just need to relax. You're just, that's evidence of the fact that you're walking far beneath. Far beneath your God-given, blood-bought right. Far beneath, and you're beginning to attach yourself to the things of the world, and you're beginning to, you're, you're getting offended because you don't have the kind of power that maybe you heard about. And if, you, and if you stick around in this place for long, I'll be sure you're really uncomfortable with that. Why is that? Because God wants to bring you into an encounter that transforms your life. We don't need another religion. We don't need cute Christianity. We need people who have been filled with the power, the fullness of God, that hunger and yearn. And if you have no power in your life, you ought to ask the question, why not? Quit looking at the fact that you were bottle fed. Quit arguing about the fact of the different things that happened in your home that weren't so great. I'm sorry, I am. There's sin in the world, and there's a mean devil. The fact that you're breathing, that's a miracle. So take that and whatever measure of faith you have and press into God. Hunger and yearn for God and let Him come. Get rid of the distractions. Put away your Copenhagen, for God's sake. That has to be like a word of knowledge, because I don't even think I've said Copenhagen since the last time I had that, and it made me throw up in math class. Bunch of Southerners. Some boys from Tennessee or something. Hey, Bracken, what? You ought to try this right here. Just take a pinch of this right here. Just put it right. Okay. Okay, what? Do what? Just take that, put it right right here. Put it right, right in there? Yeah. And they're like, pack it down with your tongue. It said it tastes kind of funky. It was like winter green or something. I forget what it was. It started producing spittle. And so I said, what do I do with all this? They said, just swallow it. Bunch of hillbillies. There I am. Oh, I know none, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, others of you. There I am in math class. The room starts spinning. Mr. Hutchinson from Massachusetts, a football coach, very aggressive Irishman, <laughs> says, Bracket, what's going on with you? Ooh. And I just hurled, fell out, of my, fell out of the chair. Are you, are you dipping, Mr. Bracken? You're gonna see the headmaster. It's a New Englander. You gotta go see the headmaster. Which one of you southern boys gave the gave the gave the Yankee? Which one of you southern boys gave the Yankee some chew? You couldn't get me, you couldn't get me to get drunk on alcohol. You couldn't get me to backslide. You couldn't get me because I left all of that for something that's oh so much better. Oh so much sweeter. Oh so much so beautiful. Oh, one thing I desire of the Lord that I will seek after to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in it. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I can't go back. I won't go back. That guy's dead. He's dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. I've been born again. I've been washed. I've been made new. Oh, and I'm in trouble. He's just a, a word away. He's as near as the words of my mouth. I just say, Jesus, 
And he comes and he helps me and he heals me and he holds me when I'm hurting and I'm grieving. He wraps his arms around me. He cries with me. He laughs with me. He, he walks with me. He talks with me. Do you know Jesus like that? Do you know him like that? That's what Alaska needs. That's what America needs. That's what you need. Stand up on your feet all across this place and call out to God like your life depended on it. Come on, call on him. for you, Lord. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christianity is not even supposed to be discipline driven. It's supposed to be driven by the passionate love in your heart for the one who saved you. You don't have to convince me about taking my wife out for a date. I can't wait. to convince me somebody said well Hannah's going off now to her profession Daniel's out of the house you're going to concerned about an empty nest are you kidding me are you kidding me man it's revival man come on somebody I'm excited about what the Lord's going to do I'm not discouraged I'm not downtrodden and crying I mean I'll cry for a minute or two come upon me with waves. I mean, my daughter's going off into this incredible career that's a total miracle. I don't even, it's a total miracle. Yeah, I'll cry, then I'll rejoice. My wife and I will go on to have revival. How about you? What are you doing? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you desperate? <gasps> Some of you need to take a big, deep breath and let the Lord fill you. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior, and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.